This is Coda Radio, episode 85 for January 20th, 2014. everyone, you're listening to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, GoDaddy, Ting, and DigitalOcean. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this fantastic show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our excellent host on the East Coast, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Hello! my friends. I'm not sure who that was supposed to be. That could have been you. I mean, maybe we try that one time. <laughs> it's me. Yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive. Man, I tell you what, uh, I woke up this morning and I was like, oh boy, it's going to be a rough one. It's going to be rough. But then as the day went on, I'm like, you know what? Looking forward to it. And then by the time we sat down in the chair, I was ready to go. So when you showed up today and you're like, we need to start a little early. I was like, I've already started in my mind. What do you think of that? Yeah. You have angry doggies today. <laughs> I didn't. I mean, listen. Uh, Ow. Oh. I'm, uh, I'm babysitting another puppy, and this guy does not like computers. Oh, oh, but but uh, but uh, is getting is the puppy getting along with the dogs that live in the house? Yeah, he's okay. actually related to, to oh. them. Oh, or to the one at least. It's a but reunion. Yeah, he hates when I sit down at a computer. It's kind of amazing. I, you know, sometimes dogs have funny associations with things like that. Yeah. I, I used to have a dog that uh, every time somebody would hiss, it would chase the cats. And um, then, of course, my grandfather, his laugh is a That's how he laughs. And so every time grandpa came over, the cat basically <laughs> got quite the workout. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Mr. Dominic, we got an awesome batch of feedback and we love chatting with you guys and getting these emails. In fact, if anything we say this week sort of inspires you to send something into us, either a response or something we should look at or a question for us, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link and uh, choose Coda Radio from the drop down. Or even better, you can start a thread in the Coda Radio subreddit over at codaradio.reddit. Dot com. Uh, we got a couple of bits of feedback uh, this week from folks who did that, and uh, even even I even threw in a little book pick. I just like I, I know normally that's you know that's something we think about ahead of time, and we really you know we we put all these books up on a shelf, and then we take this <laughs> dart, and then we throw these darts at these books, and whichever one the dart falls on, that's the book we pick. I threw out the system today because we got a recommendation for uh, getting kids into programming. Oh, the kitties. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, speaking of that, I sort of, one of my uh, hall of shames is I, I recently picked up that, uh, is it? Had it here still, the Python for Kids book. Right. And uh, I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet. I but, thought you were going to say you couldn't do it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that would be pretty embarrassing, wouldn't it? Uh, it would be hilarious, actually. All right. Well, uh, before we get to our first bit of feedback, why don't we uh, say thank you to uh, our first sponsor this week, and that is GoDaddy. And GoDaddy is the world's number one domain name registrar. And, of course, they do more than just domain name registration. They have all kinds of great services, including including a brand new rebuilt managed WordPress hosting. If you're thinking about setting up a WordPress blog, GoDaddy's got a brand new infrastructure that makes it blazing fast, super secure, very stable, and they can throw a lot of bandwidth at it on demand. You got to go check that out. But look, for Coda Radio listeners, we've got a really good deal right now. You can use the promo code 30DEAL2. Not 30DEAL1. First, the worst. Second, the best. 30DEAL2 when you check out over GoDaddy.com. And any new product you order, 30% off. I think it's anything in the cart, my friends. So if you have several things in a cart, like a domain and an SSL, maybe, you know, maybe some hosting up in there, right? Why not? You use the promo code 30DEAL2 when you check out over at GoDaddy.com. Boom! It's go time. GoDaddy's going to take 30% off anything in that shopping cart. So a really big thank you to GoDaddy for the longtime sponsorship of the Coda Radio program. You can find a banner in our show notes if in case you forget that promo code. But it's really easy. 30 deal two over at GoDaddy.com. Go check them out if you're in a small group, a business, a large company, an enterprise, or maybe just working on an open source project with a few other people. GoDaddy has some amazing collaboration tools. Well, actually, they have the best 
collaboration tools for this kind of stuff. And they will let you do it in a way that lets you keep your username and password safe and secure to yourself. That's a huge benefit. That's a, a huge for me. So go to GoDaddy.com to check it out. Thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Coda Radio program. Okay, Mr. Dominic, let's start with our first bits of feedback. And this one is a little bit about backend as a service. Now, we hear a lot of things as a service these days, but we really actually haven't talked much about backend as a service. This came in from Jan1024188 on the subreddit. He says, hi, I've got a gig on a mobile app. My job is to develop the backend, so after some research, I've decided to go with Google App Engine and go. However, today I stumbled upon this entire new world of BAS, uh, B-A-A-S, cloud services where they abstract their backend solutions and give you a native SDK for the client side. The two applications would be parsed by Facebook for building backends for iOS and Android apps on Firebase, which is kind of real-time oriented. It's sad. It's a sad day for me as these services kind of outsource me. However... I'm pretty sure it's not all magic and unicorns. There are probably issues with vendor lock-in and flexibility. I haven't tried them yet, so I don't know for sure. What do you think of back-end as a service, Mr. Dominic? Yeah, so I've actually used Parse, um, and I took a quick look at Firebase today just for the uh, purpose of the show. They they definitely can replace the, the very simple CRUD API, right? Uh, there's a few problems there, the biggest being lock-in which you mentioned. Uh, but more importantly, they're extremely limited, right? They have a couple of ways that you can do things, and they're trying to expand, but it's never going to be as flexible as just rolling your own. Oh, yeah, it can't be. It right. can't be because they're, they're, they're designing a solution for the majority, not the specific use case. And having said that, in a very simple, you know, where you're just reading and saving data scenario, um, yeah, I mean, that... that that kind of sucks, right? Because it definitely, I can tell you in my own experience, it's definitely something that prospective clients are latching onto. Um, though in a lot of cases, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah, I, I, so I would say if your if your requirements meet their existing capabilities, and you're like you're not looking at something going, boy, once they do this, I'll really you know, I'll really be able to use them. That's never going to happen. But if the existing feature sets work for you, it seems to me like a massive for, for somebody who isn't implementing a backend. Now for somebody like me, that's a big loss because that's, you know, a lot of sysadmins make their hay these days building these cool backend infrastructures for developers. So there's, there's another uh, facet to this though, right? Yeah. Uh, The problem is these are very proprietary and if they go away, Oh yeah. Let's say, I mean, Perfect example, Parse is no longer independent. They got bought by Facebook, right? So if for whatever inconceivable reason Facebook decided to drop it, you, it's not like moving your ASP.NET API or your Ruby on Rails API to a different host, right? Right. My concern there would be is that's, that is not Facebook's core business function, right? That's right. something that helps their platform as a whole, but it is not what they make their hay on. And so you never know what the long-term prospects of something like that are. We've seen, we've seen Google kill a lot of things that didn't really you wouldn't think they were going to kill and Facebook could do the same thing. And the other question I had for you when it comes to platform is or I'm sorry back end as a service is um aren't you kind of competing with the incumbent in a sense like aren't these other services competing against iCloud and and the the Google storage mechanisms not and- really. I mean these things are, are are really competing with um writing a simple Ruby on Rails API, right? Cuz these are Right, you got it. You're, yeah. you're getting a little more advanced than just iCloud Sync, which, by the way, doesn't work. But let's just assume it did, right? Uh, you're doing basically, you know, very, very simple REST calls, GET, POST calls, but with very little logic in the actual API layer. I mean, these are, I could say, these are very seductive to a lot of prospective clients when they first hear about them. Mm-hmm. But in most cases, except for the smallest of the small, you know, a 20 minute conversation ends up with, well, this is just, you know, risky or, you know, you know, there was a great thing that Rob Connery did in one of his videos. I don't remember what it was. I think it might've been his coder to developer on TechPub, where when he was building TechPub, he kind of goes through how he made the decisions he made. And he has a one, three, five year scenario. Mm -hmm. So certainly something like parse, you know, in that one year scenario, when you're paying for the development, when, when money is the limiting factor, yeah, Parse is really attractive, right? Uh, in three years, it might start to get a little janky for you. In five years, they might not be there anymore. Right. 
the other thing is most people, um, and the writer mentioned he's doing mobile. Most people are developing, especially commercial mobile applications, very simple applications at first, and then they're expanding them to be more complex. This is, again, a scenario where something like Parse would work probably for the first few iterations, but then you'd be pushing the limits, right? Mm-hmm. So, sounds like you're not so hot on it. Uh, I generally steer people away from it. It's, I mean, I've deployed it in Parse in particular. It's not bad. It's good at what it does. The problem is you really, really, really have to have the understanding of mm-hmm. it does what it does, period. Yeah. And that's all. Yeah. Right? And if, if they decide to raise the monthly cost. So, <laughs> I have never, anyone who's ever deployed this that I know of or have worked with, has never been able to use the free plan, right? And the other plan is about $200 a month. So, you know, they could raise the price, <laughs> right? And that could get really expensive, like some of my clients found with the Azure credits, right? Mm-hmm. Once those ran out, the real prices are a little different. Mm-hmm. Well said, sir. Okay. So Dave writes in, and he's having some struggles. Uh, he needs he needs our sage wisdom. He says, in episode 84, in your server administrators versus developers discussion, it made, it, it made me reflect on my current and past experiences in working with hosting providers. Like many of your listeners, I'm a developer who has worked with clients of all sizes, and most of the time they will come to me to revamp their existing website look, remove old code, and give the old peace of mind that the website usually brings. <clears throat> so... The problem will arise in their existing hosting. Most of the time, their servers run on older CentOS 5 machines with PHP 5.2 and MySQL 5.0 with no real way to update it. I do understand that many sysops like CentOS for a long life cycle, but it is horrible to be stuck with such an old version of PHP that does not receive security updates and many features are missing. So what should I do? Should I continue to shoehorn my code in a very outdated environment in PHP, or should I try to convince them to change their hosting entirely so I can get more up-to-date PHP and go with Node.js? I understand that hosting providers like Eldland1 and Bluehost offer these similar businesses of cheap hosting with email and the traditional LAMP stack. It's really starting to show its age and can't keep up with many of the demands that clients want these days. I'd love to have Nginx as an option as Apache, but really comes off as bloated in comparison. From your experiences... What is the best way to convince a client to uproot their existing hosting solution that they have had for years, even if they are stubborn and cheap and don't like change? And thanks for the great show. <laughs> that yeah. last part resonates with me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so I, 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 maybe Chris will have a better answer for you. But in a case where the website is not in any significant way generating revenue, where they're not an e-business, right, a web or tech business, you, they're not going to change. Yeah. I mean, unless, the only the only argument you could make is this will cost you less money, but it sounds like they're not paying that much money to start. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I wonder if virtualization couldn't help here. If you could, I don't know how what access he has to the machines, but if he could load up VirtualBox or KVM and put up a more modern version of Linux, sort of like when a tree yeah, but, grows I mean, out of a dead stump. <laughs> <laughs> Would they even be willing to pay for the consulting time to do that? Well, I don't know, right? I'm gonna say yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume yes, just because they've engaged with him. For the for the purposes of my theory here, I'll say they're willing to make some changes. And you know, I, I wanted to actually back up before we address his specific question. Um, this is something that is really I've been thinking a lot about lately, in the in the sense that the traditional method for Linux servers and Windows servers too, obviously, is um, vendor on high releases you a snapshot that they deem is stable and that they promise to keep up to date for years. You install that version of this holy blessed Linux on your server, and it is supposedly going to be fine for you for years. However, the dirty secret in Linux is within six months, you're starting to see, oh yeah, there's a few things that I don't have. Within a year, you're like, oh man, I really wish I had X. And within two years, that Linux box is so out of date, it is like 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 our dear writer right here, Dave is is noticing. It's hard to even develop something that you want to sell to your clients anymore. And this is a major problem that Linux hosting faces. And we are reaching this point with a lot of LAMP deployments that are out there on the web right now. And I'm not trying to make this into a case for rolling distributions, but I will tell you this: this is something that I think people are going to have to look at. And I hope that things like Docker fix this kind of stuff up. Because Dave could use something like Docker. He could create a Docker instance. There's very little overhead. It's very fast to get running. Now, I don't think it would run on CentOS 5, so this is going to take some time. 
you know, existing installs are going to have to get replaced. But over time, Docker should help eliminate things like this for guys like Dave. And the best part right. about it is he could create it at home or wherever he's at his office and then bring it to the client, deploy the Docker instance, and everything's going to work just like he set it up earlier. So I guess to me, I read his question differently. Not that they're using VPSs, but that they're using like a, a you know, $5 hosting plan. Yeah, no, so. I think that's what it is too, yeah. Right. Well, I can tell you our sponsor, GoDaddy, from experience, you can actually call them and get them to give you, uh, I think, Ruby and Python, and I'm sure a few other things. Yeah, yeah. Some hosting plans. providers like GoDaddy are, do it. Yeah, yeah. What they do is, by default, they only give you LAMP because they don't want people, I guess, screwing with it. Uh, but having said that, if if their hosting provider won't take that phone call and do that, you know, complimentary... Um, we have a 30% off deal. You can... <laughs> yeah. Well, I know GoDaddy does it for free because I call them every time I have to do one. I I guess, Chris, I, I agree with you 100% on the on the Docker stuff. Um, I, I think the rolling distro thing would be a nightmare on the server. But I, I think that's not really... Like, the Docker thing solves the problem, you know, for Greenfield projects going forward, right? Yeah. It doesn't solve the legacy problem, which... Right, his real problem is really right. that client. It's not so much the server. It's actually convincing that client... It, it, he's got to make the he's got to make a little business case basically a little what he needs to do is sell them he needs to sell them on the concept of why why it's worth their time and money and if he can successfully create it doesn't have to be some big presentation but if he can create if he can create some sort of pitch on this is what it'll get you this is how much it'll cost and this is how long it'll last you this will be the value of it they might go for it well another thing is if their website's a little dated or you know, I, I had a case like this where the best way to pitch them to upgrade their technology was actually to pitch them to re-roll their site to upgrade their whole and you thing. Can, you know, you can also push on the security aspect too. Right. That that if they have e-commerce, that should probably win you the day, right? But or if you know of a good way to just easily deface their website, but not in like a bad way, just put like a little cat gif on there. <laughs> Well, I, I don't, I don't, don't do condone that. that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you just put like a little dancing Luigi on there somewhere. <laughs> totally joking. Gif. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a problem outside of the, the web space, though, right? This is the, the legacy problem. This is the VB6 problem, right? It mm -hmm. worked for five years. Yep. So, yep, totally. you know, totally. no one's going to invest in it. Yeah. And, and I actually feel like this is um, something that Linux is particularly bad at compensating for because of the dependency hell you can so quickly find yourself in when you try to upgrade something just like PHP where then yeah. all of a sudden it's going to want to pull down a whole new version of Apache with it and then that's going to want to pull down all new modules and it's just it's this avalanche of of awfulness that you can you can find yourself in so virtualization and docker help normalize these things out but like Mike said you know if they're paying for something super cheap and they're not willing to spend the money you're just as screwed so you got to fix the problem there first. right or for something that's already live is really the issue right if it's yeah. not a new project where you could just say we'll do it in docker yeah 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 hmm. all yeah. right that's uh by the way did red hat buy centos or they, something well they aqua hired yeah there was no entity to buy, thing. but yeah, isn't that interesting? I actually yeah. think it's huge for people who have CentOS deployed. I, I think that's a big deal for server-side Linux, and if I'm Mark Shuttleworth, I just took a shit in my pants. Yeah, it is also that, I think, because right now Ubuntu is is doing very health, healthy in cloud deployments, quote-unquote, on AWS right. and on DigitalOcean and places like that. Oh, Di for sure, yeah. DigitalOcean released a stat last week that said like 60% or something like that of cloud instances are Ubuntu and I think it's similar stats for Amazon. And I'm aware of it because I'm paying for at least half of those. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, you got to figure Red Hat's looking at that and going, why, why we're, we're losing on all this market here. But you know, where they do have a bit of a beachhead is CentOS. So let's just, we'll put them on our team and and away we go. And what's interesting is it's a, it's a bit of a reversal to where Red Hat was before they split Fedora from Red Hat. It's a back. It's, they're kind of gone back to where they were in the in the late '90s, I guess. I don't I don't remember when that was now. But anyways, interesting things ahead. It's definitely a story I'll be watching. So Adam wrote in, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Adam. He says, "Hey guys, I really love the show. I listen to it every Tuesday morning on my way to school. It's uh, 3 a.m." Uh, when we're live, I guess. Or at uh, oh, he says, or, yes. or he'll listen 3 a.m. during the holidays. Wow, that's dedication. So, he's just about to start his final year of high school, and I'm unsure, he says, where I should be going after I'm done. 
I live in Australia, and I'm studying the subject of IPT, Information Processing Technology, which focuses on creating software. I could give you its official definition, but it'd be pretty dull. I love coding, but I find the options available to me after I finish school confusing. There's software engineering, computer science, or information technology. I just want a career where I can program, and I'm confused about where each of these paths lead. What advice do you have on choosing a course, or should I skip all that and head straight into the industry? Thanks, guys. Adam. Mm. Well, so where do you, so he's asking, I guess to boil it down, he's saying, you know, I'm looking at my options when I jump out of high school and I really just want to be able to sit down and be a code monkey for a while and just enjoy oh, the hell out school. of it. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. dude, dude go, to, go to school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so uh, he's got, so, you know, this is hard when you're in high school because you feel like you really got to, you really got to make this really super critical choice, but in reality, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It, it's a fucking, it's a joke. All right, so let me tell you the dirty little secret about tech degrees. They're all meaningless, and they all virtually mean the same thing. Uh, and the sad part is computer science at University A, computer, which is the most common name you're going to see, right? Computer science at University B could be two entirely different courses. Yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, for instance, my local university, Monmouth U, is one of the most respected in the state. They don't consider programming to be part of computer science at all. That, that to them, computer science is a math discipline. Mm-hmm. Programming is a is a bachelor of art in programming or software development. I think they call it. So all these different schools have different names, different focuses, and it, a lot of it depends. My alma mater, Ryder University of Lawrenceville, New Jersey, considered computers to be a subset of business. So instead of calculus, you took accounting. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And you learned they would write papers, and they also did development, but they would write papers on. Um, you know, what is the business reason to do this application this way? Mm-hmm. So there's all the, and, and granted writer is not known for their, their computer course. They're a, an art and that kind of school, but it, it's, it, it, I understand it feels like a huge decision. It almost doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, it matters. Mm-hmm. Certainly if you, if you get a four year degree in basket weaving, that's not good, but you know, if you know you want to be in tech, go ahead and get a tech degree. Now, whether your tech degree says computer science, software development, software engineering, um, you know, computer information systems or whatever. I mean, Chris, there's a bunch of other trumped up names, right? Yeah, yeah. We, could be, we could sit here for about an hour. Yeah. It, yeah. it almost doesn't matter because you know what you're going to take? You're going to take two years of Java <laughs> no matter where you go. Yeah. And unless your school is one of those, those Microsoft schools where you take vBasic instead. And you're going to come out barely know how to program anything so <laughs> you know what I mean, that deserves <laughs> yeah it, it's just a piece of paper but you, it'll certainly help your life yeah oh, for oh sure. and when, you, when you're when your comp sci teachers tell you how important calc and trig is they are flatly wrong it would have been much more helpful oh wow wow that's a great quote that is a great quote right there well said sir well, uh, that's good advice, and of course, um, it's it's. I agree with Mike. It seems like a really huge decision, but uh, go in a direction that your gut is telling you to go in, and it'll it'll work out. You got plenty of time, my friend. You're you're very fortunate. Yeah, you have lots of time, yeah. I'd, and I'd say take some minors in something different, right? Like something be a little more well rounded. Yeah, yeah, that's very yeah. it's very good, and. You'd be surprised because if you're really passionate about something, when you work at something else, you will find ways to apply lessons learned there to your existing passion. I know that sounds really weird, but I, I'm so often surprised when I'm doing something completely unrelated to yeah. show production and doing shows, and I go off and do something, and I, I get some sort of insight or or something that I can apply to my regular thing, too. So try to be open to other ideas and uh, just experience them and... It all works. Yeah, out. I just I just want to call something out in the chat room. Don Thornton Jr. says one of the best and better programmers that I worked with had an English lit degree. That shouldn't surprise you. I don't believe you. It's the truth, Chris. This is the future. Get the hell out of here. Shakespeare <laughs> was the first Unix hacker. Oh, wow. 
All right. Uh, well, so uh, before we go to our next email, which looks like a doozy, I want to thank our next sponsor this week, and that is Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting does not believe in locking you into a contract or making you pick a plan. That's why they have no contracts, no early termination fees, and you only pay for what you use. Also, there's no overages or penalties in a model like that. It's a better way to do mobile. It's really cool. So let me tell you a little bit about Ting because it's it's so unique, so so unique and refreshing. They don't do plans. They take your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them up at the end of the month, and whatever bucket you fall into, that's just what you end up paying. So since I I avoid using the voice minutes like I don't know like they're radioactive I just don't like using the phone text is fine email is fine even Skype is fine but I don't use the phone very often so it doesn't make much sense for me to pay into some huge contract that I'm not getting full advantage of that's why I love Ting's model of just paying for what I use I do use some data and I do use text messaging that's fine it's six dollars per month per line you can have multiple lines with a shared pool of minutes so it's super nice for teams um, we're gonna have a Rikai joining the Jupiter Broadcasting team in a couple of months. And uh, when he joins up, I'll be giving him my HTC One. It'll all be on the same Ting plan. And again, it's simple and logical. He's only going to pay for what he uses. Uh, they, the Ting dashboard makes it super crazy easy. And every plan includes voicemail, picture messaging, voice, uh, uh, video messaging, three-way calling, caller ID, tethering, and hotspot. Yes, tethering and hotspot. It's pretty nice. Uh, my bill right now is usually around 30 30 bucks a month. That's down from $120 a month for two phones. And right now I, I got the Nexus 5 and I have it on wireless charging. That feels like the future. There's lots of great phones over at Ting, tons to choose from. And when you buy these phones, you own these phones. That changes the value structure for the long term in a really big way because you don't have to only get the use out of your phone during the contract because you're only paying for what you use and you can easily activate and deactivate it with the Ting dashboard. You can keep using it forever. As long as that phone works, you can turn it on and use it when you need to. They've got the HTC One. If you go over to coderadio.ting.com, that'll take $25 off your first device. And they already have a sale on the HTC One right now as it is. So that's a great time to pick one of those up. You can grab the Moto X. Totally yours. You own it outright. These aren't subsidized where you're actually paying it off over two years and not getting the value out of the phone. You buy them right now. They have phones that range the entire gamut from the Note 3 down to feature phones that start at $73 or $63. You buy these, you own them outright. And you can also just grab a SIM card if you go get the Nexus phone from the Google Play Store like I did. I got the Nexus 5. I grabbed the Ting SIM card, pop that in there. Bob's your uncle. I'm good to go. They also support a lot of Sprint compatible devices. You can check out the BYOD page and see what phone you can bring. They'll answer your questions there. And they will help you get out of a contract. You can go to ting.com slash ETF to get information about that, but it's pretty straightforward. You just pick your phone, you port your number, and then you submit your ETF claim and Ting will pay up to $75 per line that you have to cancel. So go to coderadio.ting.com to get started. That'll go right to their landing page where you can click their how would you save and put in your saving or your uh, your current bill information and then you'll see how much you'd start savings. It's the beginning of a new year, so why not start saving now and help Ting change up and clean up the mobile industry. So go to coderadio.ting.com and a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. All right, Mr. Dominic. So we had a question. I have one more interruption. Uh huh. Go ahead. We need to thank, or at least I need to thank, uh, a few Code Radio listeners for sending me pounds of coffee. Oh, oh yeah? Oh, great. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not going to mention names because I didn't ask previous permission. Or I don't, you know, I know sometimes that's weird. But thank you, guys. There are two of you. Uh, one sent me this amazing espresso blend. And the other one, which was, let's just say I had a lot of energy this weekend. <laughs> played a lot of Skyrim very efficiently. <laughs> Uh, the Didn't other one sleep a me, wink, but <laughs> no, I, I I might pass out and die, but hey. Uh, and the other blend was a a was much more mild blend, but very good, very sweet floral hints. I think it's um, I, I have it in the other room. San San Hacienda. Now, there's you, another name there. I'm missing something. It's San Pedro Hacienda. Are you drinking this with the French press? Of course. Nice. I I have I have discovered that the if um. If I make myself a cup of coffee, that is a good judge if my life is organized. If if it ends up that I did not have enough time before a show to make yep. a cup of coffee, then I, I wasn't doing something right that day. So I haven't had as many cups of coffee recently as I would like. <laughs> but and I also have a confession to make. Oh, yeah. Well, go I, ahead. I may have recently purchased the Ashton Kutcher Steve Jobs movie. What? Did you watch it? Not yet. Yeah, I just can't bring myself to watch that. 
So I'll wait for your word on it. Uh, it, it I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be $20 I want back. Um, you know, I, did you read the rants on Google? Oh, not rant, but aggressive complaint from, from uh, Waz on Google Plus about the movie? Uh, I heard that he's not very happy with it because it makes him look like a dope, basically. Yeah, he said he just totally downplays his contribution and flat out lies about him at several points. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, you know that's gonna happen because now he's now Steve Jobs is a myth, right? He's he's beyond one man. He's a populist myth, I guess. I don't know. It's like he's Lincoln, the man, myth, the legend. Also, like, Chris. Um, so, how's that Nexus Five? Well, uh, I like it. Why do you ask? You sound like you're why? Because you want me to get the HTC One Red? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> that HTC and One. Send me your Nexus Five if you see you see what we're doing. Oh, I do see what we're doing there. Well, uh, I'll tell you. Um, so the I I think between the phones the HTC One is a better phone. Um, however, uh, what I don't like about the HTC One is my camera has developed this purple hue in the shots. Ooh, yeah, ooh. and I guess it happened to Chase too, and um, from Unfilter, and so uh, I stopped taking pictures with it, and so just that in itself is pretty much put all my usage over. That sounds like a, a hardware issue though. Did you contact HTC? Uh, I haven't, but it sounds like that is an option. Um, it just takes several days to get it all done and shipping off the phone and all that. Kinda. Oh, I found a bug in Mavericks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you sound I pretty broke excited. broke my Mac Mini. Uh, oh, really? So, you know the uh, SMC controller that, does, that you know, handles how it does OpenGL and spins up the uh, Intel Iris GPU thing? Like yeah, the the SMC GPU. Con- by the way, the SMC controller in the Macs is great if you run Mac OS X. Uh, if you run mm. Windows or Linux on there, they don't have any way of talking to the cooling system in these Macs because of this SMC controller. So I was doing something very OpenGL intensive and then stepped away to use the restroom and I got a phone call while I was walking back from the hallway. This was at work. so Is this Skyrim? <laughs> this OpenGL intensive thing? <laughs> it was on Mac. It may have been World of Warcraft. Oh, okay. You're playing World uh, of Warcraft on a mini? I guess, it's, I guess that works, I guess. Listen. I, the manager at the Genius Bar hates me. They have my sign, wanted, dead or alive. <laughs> I go to the Apple store. They say, can we can we show you to the Microsoft store, please? Wow. <laughs> they, they don't want to deal with me because I'm just like, listen, I paid $1,000 for the computer. I'm going to use it. So I, I have burned through uh, 2011 MacBook Pro, uh, uh-huh. uh, uh, an iMac, and a, oh, and a mini, an older school mini, not the newer form factor minis. All of them doing some sort of video encoding related yeah. task. Like they, they're so small and I think Apple is so conservative on the cooling to keep the sound down that yep. they cook them. So I'm averaging six to eight months on Apple laptops. Whoa, whoa, about, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, no, 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 sir. No, that can't happen because that those things are. Well, I mean, if we go listen to back, back episodes, go to radio, you can literally track when I've replaced machines. I mean, that's just the, for the for the price you pay. They should be lasting right. years. Well, to be fair, some of the replacements I haven't paid for. Right. I mean, okay. usually I'm getting, you know, for for the capital, I'm getting about a year because I bitched them out the first time and then they give me another one. But see, this is one of the reasons why I feel like the Mac Pro is if you're if you have to buy a Mac, the Mac Pro is really the best option because it's the only one that has a right. proper cooling system. However. I've also read that the new Mac Pro, Mac Pro trash can is specifically designed under the assumption that the GPUs and the CPUs will not be maxed out at the same time for a long period of time. That seems like that seems like yeah. a really bad assumption to make on a fi- on a machine that's pretty much built for Final Cut. Okay, and just to answer the chat room, so what I'm doing is you know, I need approximately 6 gigs of RAM to do most of my work what I'm doing, right? Uh, now, to be fair, iOS development, Mac development takes less memory in most cases. Android development takes a lot more, at least on OS X. And part of that's because I have to run different emulators, right? Things like that. So I buy machines for about 8 gigs of RAM. Um, that apparently doesn't work. <laughs> but the, the new issue with the SMC controller seems to be... There's two potential issues I found. One is Maverick's new compressed memory feature, mm-hmm. where it will start compressing memory too fast instead of just doing straight swap, and you run out of memory if you don't have a lot of room free on your hard drive. Now, those of us using SSDs of 256, where you know 240 is full, 
that happens really fast. Well, I thought memory compression was like basically it keeps it in RAM, but it's just like gzipped essentially in RAM. Obviously not gzipped, but I've read a few things. So some people are experiencing the issues I'm I'm experiencing, and have been told that it's memory compression. So it's like a it's like swapping right. part of it to disk. Right. Now the problem with that being the issue is that it works. My MacBook Air doesn't seem to have that problem, but the Mini does. So I continue to do some digging and I did some very creative logging, it looks like the SMC controller got confused at some point and spun down the GPU because it thought, or the, uh, you know, the, the stupid integrated thing because it thought it was overheating and has never flicked that setting back despite me restarting it, restarting the SMC controller through their weird voodoo, you know, hold command mm-hmm. thing. So what it's doing is it's not allowing the computer to actually use it. Which makes it run noticeably slower. Oh, so wait a minute. You mean it disables the GPU? What it's is just it? straight disabled, yeah. Like, so you have... So how does in the Mini, does it have two GPUs? Does it have like an Intel GPU and then like a... No, it has the Intel one, but it, it treats separately, right? So the controller will decide when to spin it up, spin it down kind of thing. It, it gets a little muddy because of the way... You know, before it used to be you had a graphics card and a CPU, right? And the graphics card would spin up. And the CPU would spin up separately, quite separately, right? On the Max, there's this weird combination thing going on. Um, but the bottom line is, my Mini seems to think that it can never spin that up. One of the issues is, this is not a software thing on the OS level. So even if I repaved it, it would still be a problem. This is like a flaw in the SMC controller. Well, this is a bug that happens when the computer falls asleep when it was running too fast. Because I I stepped out of the office for a few minutes. Oh my gosh! How right. annoying! It, it's it's a glitch in the way that firmware thinks. This is what I'm finding. Um, what's also very frustrating is, you know, I'm going to take to the Genius Bar because I called them and they're like, "Yeah, that's that that's um, like, oh, it could be a hardware malfunction." Great. So can you replace the part? No. <laughs> awesome. Wow. It's yeah. probably a whole motherboard swap. Well, that's the problem. It's all soldered in there, Which right? means CPU and RAM and whatever, right? More right? importantly, or not I don't have Apple Care on this one. Oh, yeah. 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 This is a new one. So what do you think? What are you going to do? New machine? Well, I'm going to take it and see what they say. I'm hoping there's a way they have like a utility where they can manually go in and flip that switch, right? So this is, I know we've talked about this before, but this is right. truly the problem with Apple hardware is... They they honestly, like, the laptops are the best example of this, is they obviously make choices that will please 80% of the people 90% of the time, or something to that equivalent, right? It's something where, in, in most use cases, enough that Apple makes a good profit, it's fine. But there's just little things that I constantly run into that if right. if... if if they just allow their operating system to run on alternate hardware, like don't even support it, just allow it, <laughs> you know, it would be so much easier for so many people. Like there would be an industry overnight that would prop up around making that work. And and it would allow people to continue to use their ecosystem without having to be locked down to these choices. So what I found on this particular case of other people who've had it, had I simply gone in the settings and disabled sleep mode, this never would have happened. Disabled sleep. I mean, no, who, really, this, yeah. comes, nobody does that. Really, I mean, I mean, right. So, the, to, to me, I'm finding that there's this over optimization for energy consumption, which makes a lot of sense on a laptop. It makes no freaking sense on a desktop at all. Yeah, both both Windows 8 and the recent Macs, right. they all do this, and then they, they claim they're being green. Oh, well, we're, we're uh, the the new operating. I think I literally saw when Windows eight ships. They they talked about yeah they did talk about this. They talked about how the new energy saver settings will save the world x amount of energy uh, a year. And it, of course, it's all just completely theory. Well, which I totally support, but you know, make sure it doesn't also break the system, right? Yeah, that seems like a pretty big flaw. Well, it, but you have. I mean, it's it's. I I can understand how it's not been addressed in a firmware update or anything yet, because well, you I, have to do you have to I don't, do a very specific set of things to get it to happen. I don't understand why it is literally the year two thousand and fourteen, and our computers 
are still so stupid when it comes to sleep mode. Like the computer behind me that you're Skyped into right now. Right. It keeps going into like this, turning the screen off and going to low power mode. Why can't it say, hey, you know what? I'm in a Skype call right now. There are right. certain things that the operating system expects of me, so I'm going to continue to run. Or why can't something say, hey, you know, there is a process running right now that's using the CPU and the GPU, and we're not going to yep. go to sleep until that's done. Until that process is terminated, yeah. Now, I, I, th- I thought they are supposed to be working on that in Mavericks. It just drives me crazy. That well, they are. I mean, the, on the whole, until I found this problem, Mavericks was a, a, a real good boost. I mean, I was getting better performance. I was, you know, I like it visually. Everything was great until I hit this weird issue. And what's very frustrating for me is, you know, I call it the, I, I, I joke around with my, a friend of mine who now works at Fingertip. I call it the genius bar dance, right? Because I take it there. I stand there. They do their, they run the same diagnostic check. Uh, now, in the case of my older machines, they say, oh, well, you don't have standard RAM. Now they can't do that because the damn things are sealed. And they'll tell me, we'll call you tomorrow, right? And they're going to call me tomorrow and tell me that they're going to try reinstalling OS X. Great. It's not going to work. They're, <laughs> they're going to call me the following day. <laughs> right? It's just the same process over and over again. Yeah. And, and I understand why they don't listen to me when I tell them that I've already done this. You know, I've done all these basic software steps. Believe me, I would not have driven a half hour if I didn't need to, right? But, you know, it, I'll be amazed. I mean, hey, freehold mall, genius bar people. If I walk in and you guys just fix it, that's the other thing. I'm not one of these people who walks in and wants another machine. I hate getting another machine. Mm-hmm. So that means I have to spend a day configuring yeah. it. I have to do SSH keys for GitHub. Right. To do SSH keys for my Atlas and stuff. And I now mean, most of the times, a, pain. a new machine doesn't feel that much faster than an older machine if the older machine had an i7 or i5 with an SSD. Well, not only that, until I sync Dropbox, I can't use it for work. Right. Right. So it's it's kind of it's like... This major, it's this major uh, detour in your productivity. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to be fair, because Alex was saying it's, you know, it's a good experience for them. They are very polite. It's just they have this issue that, that I guess makes sense, right? Since most people going into the Apple stores are, quote, normals, they don't really care what you tell them. They're running through their script no matter what. Yeah. And also, it you'll, you know, you can also in these experiences, you'll you'll discover that Apple really has products they care a lot about making the customer happy about, and then mm-hmm. they have products they just really couldn't give a crap if you never buy another one again. And I think the Mini falls into that latter category. Well, one nice thing about the Mini is they will very, very eagerly hand you another one. Yeah, well, they got a whole ton of them sitting around right. in the back because... Uh, they don't sell. I mean, they're not... Well, they actually would be a... There, there's a, there is a good, you know, like for a little encoder, for like a flash media encoder or an audio right. stream encoder... They make sense. I mean, I know a lot of production shops buy a ton of them, but they have not updated it for 454 days. Okay? they ha- yeah. The last time they released the Mini was Oct- October 23rd, 2012. I'm looking at the buyer's guide right here. That is, I mean, that is malpractice. That is so offensive. That is ridiculous that they're still selling a computer from... October 23rd, 2012. And let's point out that when they released it then, it's not like it was some powerhouse machine at that time. So the Mini mini has always been your little workhorse, though, right? It's it's not... Time for an update. Big time. You know, you don't don't call your... You know, even even for Apple people, you don't call your friends like, yo, I got the new Mini. The Mini is the... (laughs) I mean, come on. It, it is what it is, right? It's yeah, the yeah. it's the dev machine. It's the media machine. It's your. I know guys who like to spend money and use them as file servers. It's not the sexy thing. Now, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, show that off to friends, family. The mm-hmm. Mini is kind of like, hey, this thing is like, you know, this gets the this is my beige box or my silver box in this case, right? It gets mm-hmm. the job done. Mm-hmm. Having said that, yes, Alex is probably right. The margins have to be glorious at this point. Yeah, really seriously. Um, all right. Well, we got an, we got a question uh, from ClickTop here. Uh, click, oh, no. click to tap. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, I wanted to read this, and then uh, we'll uh, we actually have. Let's see. We have uh, we have Some a more. couple of more. Yeah, and one of them is a, a Windows 8 defense email. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, uh, so. we can actually just 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 call it at this one then. What you don't want to read the Windows 8 defense one? I, I'm just trolling. Oh, <laughs> you're like, no, we don't not, We're not going to do that. Uh, all right. Well, he says, uh, hello, Chris and Michael and the moons of Jupiter. I'm a PM working in software web development for the last five years. I was thinking the Titans of Jupiter, by the way. I think that's better than the moons of Jupiter because, you know, Titanism, the Titans. OK. All right, anyways, uh, for the last five years, I've seen mockups that make or break a project. Some similar 
uh, some smaller clients want to make their own mockups, usually getting their in-house or contracted graphics designer to take a stab at a web design for the first time. This eventually turns to a back and forth tutorial session with the designer, getting them to detail actual dimensions and behaviors in their work. I don't let this happen anymore. But the non-tech <laughs> graphics designers sometimes still pop up to provide input on your mocks, often about colors and graphics, which are not important to the mocks anyways. With large enterprises, mockups are detailed and to a T and approved by a dozen plus people. In addition, there are copy decks, technical requirements, and business requirement documents that need to line up with the mockups so that all can be approved by another dozen folks. Hour-long conference calls with half a department on the line, but only one or two speakers uh, ensue. Uh, usually over a very small, trivial items that could be handled in an email if someone was responsible instead of a dozen people. When you crack open the first draft of a mock-up on a project that you are just starting, what are some of the things that relieve you and make you say, whew, this is going to be smooth? In turn, what are some of the things that make you grind your teeth and get the coffee pot prepared for a long night of email replies? Thanks, Roy. <laughs> wow, when he's talking about... Oh, yes. Oh, man, I can just so visualize some of this stuff. Like... It's so he's nailed it. He's nailed this. He's obviously Roy has done this a few times because he's just so nailed he, it. I mean, I'm just going to jump right in because this is like one of my pet peeves. If you're a graphics designer, for the love of God, when you're doing mock mockups, don't actually make them the color you want. Just throw the hex code in there, right? Yeah. yeah. Or the RGB, or held the stupid Adobe RPG, right? It doesn't matter. Um, in fact, when I see mockups in color, I I sometimes get a little concerned because. Well, that's funny, like he was saying, like, uh, people on there are, it's so true, people will always critique the color, you know, they'll always, you know, well, maybe we should yeah. try this rounded, things like that, okay, yeah, you don't understand, we're not at that stage yet. <laughs> right, that, that's like the thing we do the day before we release it, like, let's, yeah. <laughs> you know, it could be neon pink for a month, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Oh, geez, I got a lot more, I mean, I could just keep going. Uh, you know, when people tell me sizes and fonts may change, yet they have a 50-page mock-up. Right, like a whole design doc. Love it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely uh, when I see when I have seen in the past, um, uh, like a proposal that comes in on, on what somebody wants to get done or actually more like a request. Uh, if there are certain things on the paper that would just leap at leap out at you immediately. Like timelines are always a good indicator. The amount of servers, the money they want to spend, the equipment, all that kind of stuff for me has always been, you know, those always kind of set the tone for me. It's never really, truly been one particular thing. However, and of course, Mr. Dominic would have you believe that I'm completely anti-corporate, but I, I really, I have definitely learned, and I think Roy's learned this way too, that there's a sweet spot for, for my type of work where somebody's not so little that they can't afford anything, but not so mm -hmm. big that you have to have the dozens of people on there. Yep. And he's so right about like, everything has to match up with these other groups that come up with on these documents. And then everybody gets on the conference call and really only a couple of people have anything to contribute at the yep. most. But at any point in the time, any of them could raise a flag and slow the thing down. Uh, I, I, I would love to see some sort of, I don't know, maybe this is out there and I just haven't seen it yet, but this feels like it's ripe for the pick and for like some sort of web app solution, some sort of collaborative web app where people go in and they check things off, they agree to them, and there's like a there's like a process. And the other thing is you need an owner, right? You need you need people responsible. And one of the things, going back to Apple, just this made me think of this, <clears throat> is I always thought it was really fascinating that uh, at Apple, if you want to start a project, you have a piece, every project has a piece of paper with a, this is from what I've been told, from uh, somebody who's primarily responsible for that project, and then the person who's secondarily responsible. And the, and back when Jobs was running the place, the person who was primarily responsible, if you screwed up, if something went wrong, that was the person that got yelled at. So it was, it was, it, it was their burden to make sure that they saw everything got through to the end. And I think that kind of corporate responsibility is so critical and it is so lacking. Bureaucracy enables this total deferment of blame and this total deferment of responsibility. And anytime you get into a project like this where everybody's mocking things up and making big change and there's maybe your website, so there's e-commerce uh, profits are on the line, you know, things like that. If the sites goes down, you don't make money. All of these things are on the line. The more people want to defer responsibility and blame. And that can be such a nightmare to work with that when I start to smell that situation, I really ask myself if it's worth it. And, you know, a lot of times those types of clients can pay enough to make it worth it. But you, you for me at this point, I I wouldn't take it anymore. Not yeah, anymore. But I, I have the rule of CC. 
if more than three people are CC'd on an email that got sent to me, I know basically the person sending the email is just trying to do some ass covering. Ha- have I told the time, have I told the story about the time uh, I turned down a job at Microsoft in their Linux division on the show? Have I told that story? You may have, but it's worth hearing again right. if not. I'll tell it real quick. I'll give you, I'll give you the abbreviated version, but first... I want to thank uh, our sponsor this week, and that is the great folks over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm a baller, but I think I have that down to 47 seconds. So let's see if you can beat that, people. Users, you all, users, not only could you create that cloud server in 55 seconds, but hey, you also get, for $5 a month, 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And let me tell you, DigitalOcean has some rocking fast connection speeds, and when you pair those with the SSDs, you really notice it. I've been running an Archbox up there now for months, and I have it doing all kinds of things. And one of the interesting things that people in our audience have been doing is, Mike, have you heard of Yassi? Are you familiar with this? It is Not, not that I can say I am, no. It is a peer-to-peer search engine. It allows you to essentially roll your own Google. And uh, I've heard from a few folks who deployed an Ubuntu droplet and then installed Yassi up there. And now they have their own search engine. I use it to distribute files to do a little minor web hosting. And I've also been thinking about using a DigitalOcean droplet to to host my email. See, DigitalOcean allows you to spin up and shut down droplets as you need. They have pre-packaged droplets that run Ubuntu, Arch, Fedora, CentOS... With some with the LAMP stack, some with Docker pre-installed. They have a very simple interface It's in, with an intuitive control panel, and power users can replicate it on a larger scale with their straightforward API. And DigitalOcean also has locations in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. And on top of that, their website also has a bunch of great resources to get started. They have a vast collection of tutorials in their community section on their site, and you can even submit something. If DigitalOcean publishes it, you'll get paid $50 per published piece. So here's what I want you to do. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code CODERRADIOJANUARY. Coder Radio January, when you check out, will get you a $10 DigitalOcean credit. If you grab the $5 box like I've been rocking for months now, That'll let you run it for two months to see what you think. And there's so many things you can do when you have your own Linux cloud server that you have root access to with great performance and it's super reasonable pricing and you know exactly what you're going to pay every single month. You will be amazed. If you've not done this yet, you are going to find so many uses for it. It'll continue to surprise you. And DigitalOcean just recently spun up their millionth droplet. It's so awesome. In fact, uh, the millionth droplet winner... The person who spun up the millionth droplet uh, won $10,000 in digital hosting, hosting credit. It's pretty awesome. His name is Christian at Peckler on uh, Twitter, P-E-K-E-L-E-R. Congratulations to him. How awesome would it be if he's a, if he's a Coda Radio listener? At Peckler, if you're a Coda Radio, Coda Radio listener, let us know. What $10,000 in digital ocean hosting? <laughs> Oh, man, that guy is set for a long time. DigitalOcean has so many great features, I couldn't list them all. But all you need to know, $5 a month, 20 gigabyte SSD, 512 megabytes of memory, and a terabyte of transfer. Go use the promo code Coder Radio January to get started. Get that $10 credit. You can run it for quite a while. It's pretty awesome. Thank you, DigitalOcean, for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. All right, so just really quickly, I'll tell you my Microsoft story. Uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, before I was even really heavy into contracting, and um, I was doing the Linux Action Show at the time, and so uh, Microsoft contacted me actually through a through a headhunter, and um, went down to Redmond to do an interview, and I knew specifically uh, they specifically the headhunter had asked me you know talk to me about Linux, uh, specifically wanted to know about my Samba skills, which at the time I was very proficient in, um, and because uh, I don't know for sure. But after, after I got done with the whole process, I started to think about it a little bit. And Microsoft was building this Linux division where they brought in a few folks from the Linux community. And then they would do in-house case studies comparing Linux and Windows. And I think they really wanted to compare like Server 2003, I think was what was coming up or whatever. I can't remember the timing exactly, against Linux Samba servers. And I was, I was looking for a job and I thought, well, you know, Microsoft's a big company in this area. There's a lot of benefits working for Microsoft. And if I was ever going to work at Microsoft, I guess I'd work in their Linux division. And somebody semi-famous had just recently been hired. and I'd, I'd kind of wanted to work with that person anyways. So I thought, OK, why not? So I went down to Redmond, sat down, had an interview. 
thought, okay, this went really well. He said, okay, well, thank you. We'll let you know if we're going to have further interviews. Oh, okay, more interviews. That's fine. Not too uncommon, even though I've already had two phone interviews by this point. I go back home. Pretty soon I hear from them, yeah, we want to have you come down for another round of interviews. I got down there a couple of weeks later for this next round of interviews. I started with one person who was just sort of like a general HR type person. And then I was scheduled to meet with three of the guys who would be my managers. Now, this division, I believe, now all this is getting a little fuzzy now, but I believe I would have been the sixth person in this department, and they had three managers already for five people. And I sat through two meetings. Then the third one was delayed, so I had to sit around for like half the day, which was cool because some of the Linux guys came out and we, I talked with them and they took me around. We went to the cafeteria. I got a great behind-the-scenes tour of Microsoft. I mean, it was, it was fun. But then I sat down and had a third interview with the third manager, and I drove home that night thinking I could never work there. I just could not have three managers for a team of six people, all of this bureaucracy. And I knew because the problem is, is when you get in an environment like that, you have total blame deferment. You have total responsibility deferment. This is exactly what Roy's up against. And uh, that was enough to make me decide never to work at Microsoft. And long story short, now I'm doing podcasts. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right? All right. Okay. We, speaking of Microsoft, we should probably get to our defense of Windows uh, you yes. know, we do have a computer scientist versus software development email, but I could save that one for next week because I know you have a save it for next week. We've yeah. also uh, talked about it a little bit before. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Zach wrote in uh, like a boss and don't forget, we want your emails. So go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click contact and send in a feedback form. Choose good radio from that drop down. We need your emails now. So Zach wrote in, he said, uh, hey, Chris and Mike, thank you both for the wonderful show. I listen to Coda Radio every week without fail and haven't missed an episode. Keep up the good work. Recently, you guys have been looking for a defense to Windows 8 and the problem Microsoft has had convincing both developers and consumers that their product is the best product. I'd like to offer my input on that. I work at a large office supply company that specializes in making things easy. <laughs> I'm a sales associate that specializes in the technology needs such as laptops, tablets, phones, printers, etc. I see people every day who are hanging out by our section of PCs and usually with a concerned look on their face. Whenever I attempt to help those consumers, I am usually asked if we still sell PCs with Windows 7 because they, quote, don't like the new Windows. The issue that many people have with the new OS is how different it looks, and I don't blame them for thinking that way. Their workflow is interrupted and requires a refresh in order to get back on track. However, when I stop and show them how to navigate around the Metro interface, I see a little light flash above their heads that they usually tell me, oh, well, that's not so hard after all. Consumers want to be able to keep doing the things that they do in Windows 8, but are generally too scared to poke around and experiment with functionality. If Microsoft put out more advertisements regarding how to navigate around and, more importantly, justify why they made the changes that they did make, after 10 minutes of showing the consumer around uh, the OS, they usually are really excited about Windows 8 and eager to buy a new PC. Thanks again for the show, gentlemen. Keep up the fine work. So, is it is the real problem with Windows 8 just that people don't like change? i say that's a, a problem, right? Yeah, I think um, it is part of the problem. Probably a so big part. I, I really don't think Windows 8 is that bad. I think the issue is that it's pretty clear that they're going to backpedal significantly, right? With threshold. It, yeah. And from a dev perspective, that is incredibly frustrating. Yeah, no kidding, right? What if you had, because I know for a little bit you were kicking around maybe trying out some Metro stuff in the store. So, yeah, but it, it's... it's. So before yeah. you go too far down that route, can I can I just say, can I just, uh, devil's advocate here, I don't necessarily fully subscribe to this philosophy, but maybe Metro on anything larger than a... 12 inch screen is a flop i i just now i maybe i have two 27 inch screens and a 30 inch screen in my field of vision right now and i have on some of these screens tried out a metro application and it's silly and snapping to the edges doesn't make it better it's silly it's a huge waste and and i, I know i'm going a little over the top here but remember why they call it windows because it was right. a multi-windowed operating system, right? I mean, that was a huge deal. And that was, and th sometimes we break through things in technology and we keep them because they were breakthroughs. They were huge leaps. And I feel like full screen applications were a massive flop on OS X. They don't work on GNOME 3 and they don't work on Windows 8. 
Now, I do bu- I do buy into the fact that there is some efficiency improvements, especially on touchscreens, laptops, and things like that. And I also do buy that sometimes people just don't like doing things in a completely different way. Because it's not just change. In some ways, it's a reinvention of how you interact with the computer. Like the gestures to get to the charms bar. Right. Regular users do not try out gestures. And this is what I worry about some of these new mobile operating systems that require gestures too. And and I, I think... You know, GNOME is a lot like that. People who try out GNOME find it to be half-baked, uh, not complete, not not even meeting of their requirements to use a desktop. And I've been spending about a month in it now, and I freaking love it. Like, I've been willing to rethink the way I interact. Like, when I open a new window, I spawn up a new virtual desktop. And, and all these things. But it's taken a month of every day me making a conscious decision to be willing to try to use my computer in a new way. And that is such a massive shift. And the only reason I'm doing it is because I want to. And I don't see why Windows users would want to because their computer's been working just fine. And a lot of them still remember when they finally got multiple windows on their screen. We had DOS where everything was full screen. That sucked. So I think there is literally yeah. a deficiency in the design of Windows 8 for the desktop. Now, I, I, I think maybe Microsoft will dial it back and they'll find some sort of, you know happy medium, but I think Metro right now is risking becoming the new media center UI, that it becomes just a skin that starts up over the Explorer shell that you navigate in and then you exit out of, and then when you do any work, you're right back at the Explorer shell. Just like media center. And you're not going to sell PCs with that. That's my take. You know, I I think it's I, I think we're going to see the IBMification of Microsoft soon. I, I think they just can't, and maybe that's not a bad thing. But I, I just it's going to take I, a while. It's going to take a while. I guess I just also can't understand what they're trying to accomplish in a lot of what they're doing. They um, wanted convergence, right? Well, they did, but they apparently didn't want it that much, right? Yeah, because they didn't ma- want it enough to make Office or something like that. Well, they didn't want it enough to make Office, and they didn't want it enough to, you know, they didn't want it enough to alienate their their current customers or their enterprise customers, right? It feels like if they were going to do it all the way, and if any company had the money and resources to do it, to integrate you know, Zune Music, to integrate the Xbox Marketplace and the Windows Marketplace, to, to integrate uh, Windows Phone tiles with, this, with the Windows Desktop tiles a little bit better so that everything really feels like it's one unified, talking, communicating organism across all your devices, maybe something would be compelling from that. But right now, each, like Metro on the Xbox One, even the little I've played with it, feels like Metro for the Xbox One. Metro for Windows Mobile feels like right. Metro for Windows Mobile, and Metro on the Windows Desktop feels like Metro for the Windows Desktop. And to that point, a different the Windows team built the Metro UI for Windows, and the mobile team built the mobile UI, the Metro UI for mobile. And there's even, you know, back and forth online that the mobile guys went to the Windows team and said, hey, would you like our help building the Metro interface? And they said, no, no, we've seen what you've done. We'll build it ourselves. And so they couldn't they couldn't pull it all together. And man, it's uh, uh, I, Paul Thorat tweeted out um, that uh, that inside Microsoft, they're now calling Windows 8 the new Vista. I heard that, too, and that unfortunately makes a lot of sense, right? Pretty big misstep. Um, I, I, I mean, I know Zach, you know, Zach makes a good point. I think for a lot of for for a lot of average consumers that are just buying laptops and, you know, desktops with 19 inch screens and things like that. It's not that bad. And Metro apps are probably a little safer for them and easier to use, right? So I I mean maybe they maybe that's just fine. I don't know. It's just it's it's a hard position for Microsoft to be in when they have power users, enterprise users, and absolutely noob users. It's a it's a lo- it's a large spectrum. Yeah, and I and I think it's just they really I mean, it, you can understand how they got where they are. They're making a ton of freaking money in enterprise. Mhm. And to say that, you know, they obviously want to be a, quote, cooler company. And I think they got spooked by the iPad. I think they saw uh, they saw mobile sales going to tablets, and they're so like, we got to do something about this. The difference with the iPad, though, is, you know, 
you know, Apple gets crit- criticized for paternalism a lot, basically my way or the highway. The problem is that that only works, and it often doesn't, right? Think about some of their failed experiments. Um, but that only works if you are serious. Mm-hmm. And Microsoft has shown that they're not really serious, right? But if people complain, and, and there's nothing wrong with good customer service, it's just, you know, that's not the kind of company they seem to want to be. Yeah, and then they get, but then they say, well, we're just responding to customer feedback. So they're kind of damned right, if they do, the, damned if they don't. Right. The problem is, if they want to be the trendsetter, part of that is being ahead of the trend and not responding to customer feedback, right? Well, I, or, or, helping, or helping push what customers want into a new direction or something like right. that. Yeah. I mean, if you remember, the iPad was very, very unpopular when it came out. Um, also, you know, it was never thought to be an enterprise tool. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and it took, I mean, how, how long did it take? What, a, two, three years? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where really enterprise started adopting it? I just don't think Microsoft could tolerate that kind of lead time. But, yeah. Well, there you go. It's an interesting, it'll be, so I look at this, the reason why I, there's a lot of categories that are in flux for developers right now. And the whole Microsoft ecosystem is a huge one, right? The other one that maybe we can talk about in a future episode since we got to wrap up is um, right. uh, the uh, Internet of, oh, I hate saying this word, the Internet of Things, Internet of things devices uh, like the TVs and all of the appliances in the house that are, are going to be quote unquote software platforms. These are, I mean, these are all areas that are going to see a rapid amount of change over the next couple of years for developers. So, but before we go, uh, Andreas wrote into the show and uh, he says, I got a call from my mom, and she found this book for kids to learn how to program. I thought this would be a perfect book pick for Coder Radio's Coding Parents, and uh, it's rated for 3 to 10-year-olds. So, wow, that's a pretty big range. And you can find it over at CodyCoder.com. Oh, CodyCoder.com if you want to find this book. And uh, it came in from Andreas, recommended by his mom. And if you are a parent and you want to teach your kids what it is you're doing all day long... <laughs> Why are you grumpy today, Daddy? Uh, then uh, maybe this would be a good way to uh, kind of uh, teach them about programming. Cody Coder's Guide to HTML. Aww. There you go. Cody the Coder will help your kids learn about programming. How about that, Mr. Dominic? Don't say we're not a kid-friendly show. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very we're in support of the children, we apparently. Just, we just got super kid-friendly right there. All right, well, uh, where should we send people to find you throughout the week? Just find me at DominicM.com. Also, you can find them live over at jblive.tv on a Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that in your local time zone. We'd love to have you here because not only do we follow the chat room, but you get to bang suggest a title that we'll vote on. You get to hang out with us, tell us what we're doing right, do, tell them what we're doing wrong, and you get to star in our video version of the show. Also, you can email us, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link. You'll find links to our social profiles at the bottom of the show notes, as well as links to those emails that we read today and links to our sponsors. Thanks to our three sponsors this week. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>